Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of April. You might notice my background is a little different. I'm very excited. I have a new bookshelf so I'm going to play around a little bit with background and angles and things. Let me know what you think. But I'm excited for the chain and the opportunity to display some of my collectible books here so that's kind of fun. So we are going to talk about the books that I read in the first half of the month. If you saw my spring TBR or you saw my March wrap up you might have heard me say I don't know how much reading I'm going to get done in April. April is always a really busy month and that has panned out. <laughs> I have definitely read a lot less this month than I did last month, which is fine. I'm still reading and I've read some some good things, some okay things. It's been a little bit of a mixed bag. We're going to get into it. But yes, in fact, having family birthdays, having spring break for kids coming up, there's just there's a lot that happens in April. It always ends up being a busier month than March. It's like the 16th too. I had it in my head that I had an, an, another day that I don't have and I don't know what y'all I am it's it's a problem. So it is April 16th we're going to talk about the 13 books that I have read in the first half of April and yes that is lower because normally I'd have read 16 or 17 books by now but it's fine I'm, I'm good with this. If you're new to my mid-month wrap-ups the way that these work is I talk about all the books that I read in chronological order. At the end of the month you get all my reading stats and I go from lowest rated to highest rated but for the purposes of this video I'm just going to talk about these books in the order that I read them. I have not had any DNFs so far this month so we're not doing that. And some of these books I've talked about at greater length in other videos, so if that is the case I will let you know and give you links up above. The first book that I finished this month was Heroes of the Water Monster by Brian Young. This is the sequel to Healer of the Water Monster. It's a middle grade series with indigenous main characters that is drawing on indigenous, I believe, Dine mythology of these holy beings. So in the first book we follow a kid who is dealing with his parents' divorce and his dad having a girlfriends and you know other family stuff when he encounters this holy being that only children pre-puberty are able to see. They lose the ability to see them and speak with them as they grow older and so now he is hitting puberty. He's got a new little stepbrother and he's sort of passing the baton on to the stepbrother to help protect this water monster and I really like it. I think it's fantastic. This is a book that is dealing with the water crisis in the southwestern United States. It is a book that is dealing with environmental issues. It's also wrestling with some very difficult history of the treatment of indigenous people in the United States and because the stepbrother who's the new main character in this second book is of a mixed background and has a white parent and an indigenous parent, he is also struggling with his own sense of identity and what that means given that history. And I think for the age group that this is targeting at, it's really good the way that it's handling it and the way that even though not everybody is supportive of this boy's identity as an indigenous kid, ultimately the message of the book is that indigeneity is not just based on your blood, it's based on, on heritage and ritual and things that you learn and etc. So I really like this a lot. I gave it four stars and I think if you're looking for a good middle grade series I would definitely recommend it. Next I read Immortal Pleasures by V. Castro and this I was actually lucky enough to be part of a book tour for it and I have an entire video where I review it and then recommend other vampire books. So if you haven't seen that video yet I will link it up above. It was a lot of fun to do and I even have vampire teeth at the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of the video so that was fun. So Immortal Pleasures is a new vampire book with an ancient Aztec lady vampire that is drawing on some really interesting Mexican history in the way that it's doing things and it is also leaning heavily on the erotic. There were a lot of things that I liked about this. I feel like if you look at the reviews on Goodreads it is very interesting. And I will say I think the tone of the book, the language that it uses especially for the more erotic scenes, I think is intended to be a little bit campy and over the top in a self-aware sort of way. I think there are probably people who are going into this book expecting it to take itself a little bit more seriously and be like actually sexy and are not 
loving what they're finding. Although some people are. Some people are reading it and like, this is the most entertaining thing I've read in a long time. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. So it is campy and over the top and entertaining, but then is also drawing on some really interesting history. And I actually didn't know this until after I had made that video, but it turns out that the main character in this is based on an actual historical figure who has historically been pretty reviled, a woman who was the translator to Hernan Cortez, and it's supposed to be kind of her redemption story. This is why having own voices reviews of books like this is really useful because you have people who know that history and understand what the author is actually doing. So I do encourage you to seek those out. But what I did recognize is that it's dealing with the issues of colonization, the treatment of indigenous peoples during that time period, and then the treatment and taking of their artifacts, sacred artifacts, historical objects. And so we follow this vampire who's lived for centuries and in the modern day is an antiquities dealer returning artifacts to their home countries, among other things. But there's a lot more going on to the story. So I liked this. It wasn't totally what I was expecting. I didn't adore it, but I gave it three and a half stars. And if the author decided to write more in this world, I would pick it up. I thought it was interesting. So that's Immortal Pleasures by V. Castro. Next, I read Cushiel's Avatar by Jack. Jacqueline Carey. This is the final book in the original Fedra trilogy. I know there's more in this series, but my goal was really to read these three because last year Tor sent me them and I was like, well, I'm eventually going to read them. I loved this one. I think my favorites of the three are books one and three. <laughs> <laughs> They're both, I think, excellent. The middle book is also very good. But I would love to see more people reading this, and I can see why they've held up so well over time. One thing that I really enjoy about these, and I kind of wish fantasy books would get back to, is that it doesn't draw out plots over multiple books. Each book feels like a complete story with a complete plot arc. So even though continuing books are in the same world, following some of the same characters, they each have their own separate plot arc. It feels like different seasons of a television show, right? I think is like the closest way to, to say it. So I loved that this is its own encapsulated story. I enjoyed being back in this world. Fedra's a little bit older. She's in her 30s. She's thinking about aging. She's got this, you know, developed long-term relationship with Jocelyn, but Melisande comes back into her life with her son being missing and Fedra agrees to go and find him and goes through hell and back for it. So there's political elements to it. There is a lot of trauma, so heads up in terms of, you know, I mean, I feel like if you've read the series, you kind of know what you're getting. But like the thing that's different about this is that there are references to sexual assault of a child. It's off page. It's not on page, but you see kind of the trauma that comes with it and abuse of a child. And then there is on page sexual assault of a, a, an adult. So there is some, you know, violent elements to it. But I loved this. I gave it five stars. Thank you to Tora for sending me this series. I'm so pleased to have them. So if you haven't read them, I do recommend. I think they're fantastic and there's a reason they're kind of modern classics. Then I read Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez and I have very mixed feelings about this book. <laughs> they're like, mm. okay, so this is a companion novel to one of my favorite romances that I read last year, which had been my first introduction to Abby Jimenez. So when I had the opportunity to get a free copy from from Book of the Month with my subscription, I was like, cool, then we'll read it. I did not like this one as much. I probably won't keep this one on my shelves. There are things I love about it. I loved the first part of the book. I love the way that she's dealing with mental health. I liked the setup of these two characters coming together. And then the second half just was a lot. It kind of lost me. So this follows two characters who are co-workers, newly co-workers, and they have kind of a fraught start to their relationship that's not very good. Although a lot of it is just from some misunderstandings they're able to work through and they start to develop this friendship and then this fake dating relationship. I love a fake dating trope. I love some of the, the heavier issues that she's tackling in this book. So our hero has a lot of anxiety and social anxiety and probably some other neurodivergent things that are not specifically mentioned on page, but seeing him find 
healthy ways to cope with that and seeing her appreciate him for who he is and understand how to be there for him and their relationship for that when his ex totally hadn't really enjoyed that. I like the fake dating element and the reasons that that comes into play. And then this is also a book that is dealing with chronic illness because her brother has this really serious thing where he's on dialysis and he needs a kidney transplant and that's also a key part of the story. So those were things that I loved about it and I loved the first half of the book. The second half of the book I wanted to shake these characters. They are grown ass adults and they can't have an honest conversation to save their lives. And the majority of the conflict just ends up being lack of communication. And it was incredibly frustrating, especially because it's set up scenarios where there is plenty of fodder for external conflict where you didn't need to go so far with the miscommunication, internal conflict in the relationship. And I did find that to be very frustrating. For those reasons, I ended up giving this book three stars. I, you know, it's not a bad book. And there are things that I loved about it. But oh my god, I wanted to shake these characters. So three stars not as good as the first one in my opinion. Next I read It Waits in the Forest by Sarah Das and I absolutely loved this. I have a video that I did which was inspired by something I saw Daniel Green do which was really fun where I read the first chapter of three books that were on my TBR aloud on screen with commentary and then picked one of them to finish and review spoilers I guess but the winner ended up being It Waits in the Forest so I did read it and review it in that video. I will link it up above if you want to go check it out. It was really fun doing kind of voices for the characters and commenting my thoughts as I was reading the book so maybe go look but this was fantastic. It Waits in the Forest is coming out in May and it is a paranormal mystery with horror elements that is drawing on Caribbean mythology from an author I've read from before but what I've read from her previously was like cute contemporary YA romance. This is very different and it's so good. The way that she builds the tension and the setting and the sense of dread of what's happening and slowly unveils this mystery and the past of the main character, the twists and the turns, it's oh, it's excellent. It is paranormal so it's got some interesting bits there to it. It's got horror. I love this. It's coming out from Rick Riordan Presents and I don't know that he's really done YA like this before because this is definitely YA. He's normally done middle grade. In this one our main character is 18. She's got a boyfriend she's been sleeping with who is kind of shitty and it's you know it's got more mature elements to it than the middle grade you usually see from a Rick Riordan book. So I think that's kind of cool that he seems to be branching out. I loved this. I gave it five stars. Would definitely recommend picking it up if uh, that sounds up your alley. And if you want a taste of the writing, I do read the first chapter in that video that I linked up above. So go check that out. Next, I read Saint Seducing Gold by Brittany N. Williams. This is the second book in a trilogy of YA fantasy novels that are set in Shakespearean London. I really enjoyed book one. I also really enjoyed book two. And I do plan to continue the trilogy. I'll probably read book three when it comes out next year as well. I think the concept of this is really cool. In the first book, Shakespeare is putting on a Midsummer Night's Dream except as it turns out it's drawing on the fact that uh, the Fae really do exist and this magical contract between humans and Fae has expired and not been renewed and that is creating some problems. Our main character is a black young woman who works in the family blacksmith shop and helps to make stage weapons for Shakespeare's productions and her brother is an actor in the troupe and so she's kind of connected through that but she also has some magic of her own through her connection with Orisha and she ends up getting into some trouble with some things. So that's kind of parts of what happens in book one. Book two is continuing on with that story and she is in some further dangerous situations. There's also kind of a love quadrangle here with one person interested in her that she's not interested in and then she is interested in a girl and a boy and in book one I think I said hey I think there's a chance that this might be heading in a polyamorous direction. Having read book two I would say I think it's very likely this is heading in a polyamorous direction. So if you're somebody who always wanted there to be a polyamorous end to a romance in a YA fantasy novel I think that this might be your jam. It's a lot of fun too if you like Shakespeare but I don't think you 
you have to know a lot of Shakespeare to read these. Really liked book two. My only complaint here is that I think it's a little bit on the short side for what I was expecting. I don't say that very often, but I feel like I wanted a little more plot. There is a plot arc to the book, but I feel like a lot of it is kind of set up for book three. So it's still good. It's interesting. I enjoyed it. I gave it four stars, but it, it could, there could have been a little more to it, if that makes sense. But definitely would recommend the series if that sounds up your alley. I had this for review from Nick Alley. Then I listened to Grey Dog by Elliot Gish. I also had this for review from Nick Alley. And whew, man, it was really good. This is an interesting take on horror, but it's like quiet literary horror that is historical in nature. It's set in the past, I don't know exactly, I would say like late 1800s, early 1900s, probably early, I think it's around early 1900s, like the beginning, turn of the century, um, 1900s. And it follows a young woman who is taking up a new teaching position in this small town. She has a complicated past that we end up learning about and she befriends this widow who some of the townspeople don't like. And then weird stuff starts happening. She starts seeing things. It's unclear if she is paranoid and losing her mind or if what she's seeing is really going on. A queer horror novel that is pushing back on expectations of gender, of sexuality, of uh, propriety for women, and it's, it, it's great. <laughs> I thought it was really good. It is a slow burn. So if you are looking for a fast-paced horror novel or something that's going to be really creepy at the very beginning, this is not for you. It is slow-paced. It's a literary horror novel, but I, I think it's great. And the ending... Damn. <laughs> I thought this was very good. I gave it four and a half stars and I would recommend it. Next, I listened to New Sons. This is an anthology of speculative fiction by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors edited by Nisi Shaw. It has quite a number of stories from it. I was especially interested because it's got stories from some authors who I really love. And I would say that it's a mixed bag, but worth reading if this is your thing, if you like short story collections and you like some of these authors, because I think there are some fantastic stories in here. Maybe unsurprisingly, I ended up loving stories from authors that I already know and love. I, there were a couple that I discovered from authors I hadn't read from before that were good too, but some favorites were from Nevo, from Tanana Reeve Du, because of course they both wrote really great things. Man, Nevo's was mm, really good, like revenge story that I wasn't expecting. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Tanana Reeve Du had like this girl encountering these monsters in the swamp that are like giant leeches. That was interesting. I'm like what were the other ones? There was one from an author I hadn't read from before that was about a trans woman and her girlfriend trying to find space for themselves in virtual reality among other things and that I thought was a really interesting story. Malka Older has a story in here. There's a bunch of people. Some of the stories are really fantastic. Some of them are fine. Like so overall, I ended up giving this a three and a half star rating, but I think this is worth picking up if it sounds up your alley. Next, I read The Break of Lists by Adib Karam. I had this also for a review from Neck Alley. I am trying to get through my Neck Alley stuff. I have a lot of stuff for review, y'all. Honestly, I think the majority of the things that I read this month so far have been for review. Not everything, but most of them. Most of them. Okay, so this is a queer YA contemporary rom-com and it was great. This was a whole lot of fun, especially if you like high school drama. It is set around high school theater and it also has great disability representation. The main character is Persian and deaf and I don't know that I've ever read a book with a main character who's deaf like this where their deafness is an integral part of who they are and how they move through the world and it's part of the story throughout but also the story isn't about their deafness or disability and I really liked that. So he is a gay techie in theater. He has to work with an actor who's his ex who's kind of the worst and he's crushing on the hot 
senior swim team captain who randomly decided to audition for Jesus Christ Superstar and was really good and got cast in the lead role. Except the problem is that his sister also has a crush on this apparently straight swim team captain, so he's just gotta be happy being best friends with him. But is he straight? Ooh. So <laughs> this is messy. It's definitely messy. And I also think he has a lot more grace for his sibling than I might have under the same circumstances. It's not a bad thing, but I really enjoyed this. I ended up giving this four and a half stars and I would recommend it if that sounds up your alley. All right, had to change the battery, but we are back. The next book that I read is Just Another Epic Love Poem by Parisa Akbari. And y'all, oh my God, this book was so good. I made like a short TikTok type thing about this right after I read it because it had me crying. It's oh my gosh it's so good and so beautiful this is a YA contemporary romance that leans a little bit literary it's written in a mix of poetry and prose and it is sapphic it follows two girls in high school who've been best friends and they have for years written poetry back and forth to each other in these notebooks and one of them had been crushing on the other for a while and now they finally get together but also our main character whose primary perspective we're in is dealing with the fact that when she was a kid her mom who was an addict had major addiction issues and then left her family so she's got trust issues and abandonment issues and now that mom is wanting to come back into her life and she's not sure how she feels about it so she's dealing with a lot of stuff and they're about to graduate from high school and make decisions about their future and college and so I think this is just the perfect sort of coming of age story that also has this complex romance in it it is beautifully written I cannot say enough good things about it. I gave it six stars, which for me is a favorite of the year. So highly recommend this if you haven't tried it. It's really, really good. And even if you're somebody who doesn't normally read YA, I feel like maybe give this a try if the premise sounds up your alley. Fantastic book. Then I read Daughter of No Worlds by Carissa Broadbent. This is something that my patrons wanted me to read and so I did an exclusive patron and channel member vlog. I'll show you the picture here so you can go check that out if you're interested. And I had very mixed feelings about this book. I went in hopeful because I know some people really love this and I was like okay it's a romanticy fantasy romance. I okay number one I didn't expect this to book to be so dark and I do read dark fantasy so I was kind of okay with that but it's quite dark and very intense and I think if you look at the cover you don't necessarily expect that going in. There were things that I liked about it. Our main character has this rough backstory. She was enslaved as a child. She was sexually assaulted as a child and then has to murder her owner as a way of escaping slavery eventually, even though she tries to buy her way out and is looking for revenge but also wants to free her fellow enslaved people and needs to learn how to use her magic in order to do so. I have questions about the way that this chose to do disability stuff. I have been corrected on the patron video I made that the thing that she has that's not named this is an actual thing. So I'm like, okay, I get that. I'm still not 100% sure about the way it was used. I don't know. Other people can tell me about it. And I also think, to be honest, I maybe didn't love the narrator. I wonder how much my enjoyment of the book or lack thereof was impacted by the narrator because the voice used for the love interest sounded like a grumpy old man to me and I didn't really like that. It made it weird. It made it hard for me to be invested in the relationship that is developing. I also have questions about the power dynamics because of course I do because she's being mentored by him. So, you know, there's a little bit of that. But really, I do wonder if I would have done better not on audio. The audiobook for this first book in the series is free on Audible, which is how I listened to it. I don't own a copy of the book. But I almost wonder if I might have gotten on better with the physical book. So I don't know. I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. There were things that I liked about it. I think it was often very engaging writing. I ultimately by the end liked their relationship, although there were some things that I was like, what? <laughs> 
what is happening. I don't know. It just, it wasn't what I was expecting. I'm still not totally sure how I feel about this book, but I know some people love it and that's not how I feel, but I didn't dislike it. I don't know. If you've read this and you have thoughts, let me know in the comments down below. I am, I am still kind of split on this, but I gave it three and a half stars. Two more books to go. First I read Can't Spell Treason Without Tea by Rebecca Thorne. I was sent a copy of this for review from Tor, well from Bramble, which is their new, you know, romanticy and sci-fi romance line. But also because this had been previously published as an indie title on ebook, this is our book club pick for Patreon and channel member book club this month. So I read it for that. The traditional version comes out in May. This has been compared to Legends and Lattes, and I have some thoughts about that, which we'll talk about, put a pin in that. But this is being pitched as a cozy, sapphic fantasy romance between a queen's bodyguard and a mage who run away together to open a tea and bookshop. And... <sighs> okay, it is on the cozy side, but not in the way that Legends and Lattes is cozy. Stay with me here. So I think there are people picking this up expecting a cozy fantasy, a cozy romance. And I don't know that this is entirely meeting their expectations for that, because while there are cozy elements to this book, it also has a lot more plot, has higher stakes, which might be to its benefit for some people, people who read Legends and Lattes and were like, this was too cozy, not enough stakes, I need more. You might enjoy this better. However, what this really reminds me more of is a cozy mystery. That is more the vibe that it's giving me than what I would expect from a cozy fantasy or fantasy romance, especially because we have a pre-existing relationship in this book. And while there were parts of their relationship that I really liked, I enjoyed the caretaking between the two of them, I wasn't that invested in it as a romance. I was more interested in the slight mystery subplots that we're getting, some of which do not get fully explored in this book because there is a book two coming. I really enjoyed the ending. I thought it was fun. I liked the concept of, you know, the small town and the bookstore and how they're, you know, getting invested in this town. But I also see criticism saying this is just like mediocre high fantasy, which I'm like, I don't know that I would call it that. But I, I think if you're expecting Legends and Lattes, it, it's not really what you're getting. This is more like a cozy mystery in a fantasy world. So if that is what you're looking for, I think you will enjoy this. But I'm so curious to see what people have to say during book club because I could see this being polarizing. I gave it four stars. I liked it. I would read on in the series. Let me know your thoughts if you've picked this up. Lastly, I read Song of the Huntress by Lucy Holland. And what's funny is I had bought myself a copy of this and then the publisher sent me a copy. <laughs> <laughs> like a week later. So I have to, I, what I really should just do is go return my other copy and buy something else with that money. That's probably what I'll do. Uh, but I, clearly this was something that I really wanted to read. So thank you to Orbit and Red Hook for sending it to me. Song of the Huntress by Lucy Holland is a historical fantasy novel that is drawing on mythology, in this case, the mythology of the wild hunt and of real historical figures, a king and queen of like early 80s, Britain. I picked this up because I adored Sister Song. It destroyed me in the best possible way. I loved it. I am not typically that interested in historical fantasy from this place and time period, but I love Lucy Holland's writing. And while this didn't hit in the same way that Sister Song did, I think it's a little slower to start and, you know, like has some, some pacing stuff that some people might struggle with. I still think it is very well written. It's very lyrical prose. It's very descriptive prose. And I also just really love the project of what she's doing, which is taking this period of history and mythology and finding these spaces where queerness may possibly have existed and then filling in those gaps. And I love that as a project and I think it's interesting what she's doing here. So in this case, the leader of the Wild Hunt is a woman who had been a lover of Boudicca, a warrior queen 
in the past, but is now in this cursed state where she and her fellow sisters are, are killing people as the wild hunt, right, with this sort of fey mythology. But then she encounters another warrior queen and things begin to change for her. So we have a warrior queen who's married to the king and they have a close friendship, they care about each other, they love each other, but she is struggling because she's not meeting court expectations of her as a queen, as a woman. She has yet to bear an heir. And the reason for that in this book is that the king is ace. And of course that word is not used because it would not be of the time period. But I really like that. I think it's so interesting to have a character who's on the ace spectrum and then also have a queen who's bisexual. And the way that that is explored is very interesting, but then it's set within this world where there is political conspiracy happening, there is the threat of war, there are religious upheavals, there is ancient magic in the land, and I really liked it a lot. I think the ending is excellent. It is slower to start, but I still gave this four and a half stars, and I think if you like Sister Song, you should definitely pick this up as well. So I was a fan. And there you go. Those are all of the books that I have finished in the first half of April. Overall, I would say it's been an okay reading month. There have been some highs and some lows. Nothing I've hated, but but definitely some things that I was like, okay, I have mixed feelings on this and a couple of hits. So that's, that's how my reading is going. It slowed down a bit, but I did expect that. Talk to me in the comments down below and let me know your thoughts on anything in this video, any of the books that I read, and let me know how your reading is going. Is it speeding up? Is it slowing down. Also it's spring and it's warmer outside and I want to be outdoors and so I'm sure that's a part of it but let me know how things are going for you in this April in the comments down below. If you like this video it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.